Corner Fringe Ministries presents an in-depth, comprehensive study on the book of Galatians and the history that surrounds that book. Enjoy. We are in part 14 of our Galatians study. We are still currently in chapter 4, and we're going to be in chapter 4 for quite some time because of the nature of the uh, elements that we have to address. Now, if you remember, in our last study, we began to look at the two covenants. Remember? Paul detailed these two covenants in Galatians 4.22. I'm going to take you back there. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and he of the free woman through promise which things are symbolic, for these are the two covenants. The one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, which is mother of us all. So Paul tells us here that the birth of Abraham's two sons, the first being Ishmael, right? who was born to Hagar, who was a bondwoman, right? The second son, Yitzhak, or Isaac, whom Sarah bore. Paul tells us that they were in fact symbols, they were symbolic of the two covenants. Now, in our last study, we began to look at this first covenant, that covenant that was given at Mount Sinai, which we're told gives birth to bondage. And we spent some time analyzing the primary terms and conditions by which this covenant functioned. And we looked at these things because if we truly want to have an understanding of what the new covenant is and understand why it is superior, then you're going to need to understand what the old covenant was, what it looked like, how did it function, what were the terms, what were the conditions of it. And when we looked at these things, what did we discover? The first thing we learned is that it had a mediator, right? The children of Israel had come out of Egypt. They met with God at the foot of the mountain, Mount Sinai. And they they were coming into covenant with God. And what happened? They heard God audibly speak to them from Shamaim. The Lord had come down upon the mountain in fire with thunderings and lightnings. The mountain was quaking and they heard the Ten Commandments, the Aseret HaDavarim. They heard the words of God. They heard the primary commandments elements of the covenant. They heard the heartbeat of Torah. How did they respond when they heard God speak to them the terms of the covenant? They said, let not God speak with us, lest we die. Moses, you speak with us, and we will hear, but let not God speak with us. So what happened? The children of Israel, as they're coming into covenant with God, they ask for a provision to be made. They want a mediator of this covenant between them and God. How does God respond? He responds positively. He says, what they have spoken is good. And so he gives them Moses as the mediator of the covenant. This is the first thing I want you to bring back to your memory, is that there's a mediator under the old covenant, and that mediator is Moshe. It is Moses. The second thing we looked at uh, under the old covenant was the tabernacle, was the command for the children of Israel to actually build a sanctuary for the Lord. Now, why would they build a sanctuary for the Lord? What was the primary objective here? We're told in Exodus 25, 8, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. It's a very powerful, very instrumental component to the Old Covenant was the institution of the tabernacle because what did that do? It created intimacy, relationship, a close intimacy between the children of God and God himself. Why? Because now he was going to dwell among his people. This is a beautiful intimacy. The tabernacle, or the temple, you could say by extension, it was a house of worship. We came here to worship. It was called a house of prayer. They would come to to petition God. It was at this place. So as you can see, the tabernacle is very instrumental, very important component of the Old Covenant. And its purpose was that God would dwell with them. Now, another critical component of the Old Covenant which we looked at was the institution of the Aaronic 
priesthood. Now, the Kohanim, you need to understand, they played a pivotal role in the covenant that God made with his people. As they were the ones who literally taught Torah to the people. If the Kohanim would stand, they would give understanding to the children of Israel. They were the ones to do that. And not just that, what else did they do? They made atonement for the children of Israel. This is very important that you understand this. They were in charge of the temple services, the temple sacrifices, and by the Kohanim being ordained by God, they kept the children of Israel in good standing with God. Because what does sin do? It separates us. The Lord set up a system, a temporary system, as we're going to find out today, but he set up a system to allow an intimate relationship to continue. So when they failed, they sinned, the blood would be shed upon the altar. And then they could remain in that intimate connection with God. That intimacy was, was, was preserved, and the Kohanim, they interceded on behalf of Israel. One of the other things we looked at, was the commandments, the heartbeat of Torah, the Ten Commandments. These are the fundamental terms that were required under the Old Covenant. These are the very words that every Israelite heard as they stood at the foot of the mountain. And not just these, but under these, if you would, by many, many strings, hung additional statutes, judgments, precepts, which fill the pages of Torah. All of these things they were to be kept. So essentially, what do we have? Looking at the Old Covenant, looking at the elements and how it functioned, under the Old Covenant, we have a mediator, Moshe. We have a temple, clearly for the purpose of intimacy, that God might dwell among his people. We have the institution of the Aaronic priesthood with the sacrifices, keeping the people in line in an intimate relationship with the Father, and then also the commandments with statutes, judgments, precepts, etc. But last but not least, what else what did we find in the Old Covenant? Remember, this covenant that was given at Mount Sinai to be officially binding between God and man, it was sealed. It was dedicated with blood. Very important to remember as we continue. Now with that said, we're going to move on today, and we're going to begin to take a closer look at the Berit Chadashah, the New Covenant. What is it? Why is it? And what are the differences that exist between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant? And not just the differences, but what are the, some of the similarities? Because as you're going to see, there are some things that changed, without question. But as you're going to see, there are also some things that stayed the same. Now, I think the best way to begin here is by taking you back to the prophecy found in Jeremiah 31, that prophecy that talks about the new covenant. Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant, a berit chadashah, with the house of Israel and with the house of Yehuda. Here we find the Lord himself declares that he, he is going to make a new covenant with Israel. His people. Now, as we are going to continue here, we are going to discover something quite important, a fact about this new covenant. Listen to what he goes on to say in verse 32. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. This is so important that you understand exactly what is being said here. We were just told that the new covenant, which the Lord was going to make, it wouldn't be like the first covenant, which was given at Mount Sinai. It's going to be different, okay? Now, the reason it's important that I point this out to you is because you need to be aware. You know, if, if, if you're coming, if you're new to the Hebrew roots movement, you're discovering your Hebraic roots, through, by putting your faith in the king of the Jews through Yeshua, you need to be aware that there are, unfortunately, some teachers out there who no doubt are certainly sincere and heart, who no doubt they mean well. But unfortunately, they're teaching that the new covenant isn't exactly a new covenant. They're teaching something else. They're teaching that it is a renewed covenant. 
And I think it's important that you understand why they are teaching this. I want you to be able to identify with them and, and, and so as to empathize with them where they're coming from. In my experience, the primary reason we find some teachers teaching a renewed covenant is because these people, these teachers, they are simply responding to Christendom's behavior. Okay, They're responding to Christendom's perspective on the law of God. You know, it's no secret that in general, Christianity tends to hold a common theological belief that the law of God has been done away with. Why? Because we're under a new covenant. And so because we're under a new covenant, the law has dissolved. It no more applies to us. Therefore, because Christendom has taken this position, we find that there are some teachers who in a move to retaliate or to refute such an erroneous teaching, they attempt to counteract these teachings with the teaching that there isn't a new covenant, but rather a renewed covenant. And thus, in their mind, they feel like, hey, we are preserving the integrity of scriptures, we are preserving the law of God. Let me say this, while I can appreciate their sincere concern over what Christianity has, by and large, done to the law of God, the teaching of a renewed covenant utterly falls short of scriptural truth. It utterly falls short of the biblical witness, the biblical testimony, and it fails to understand truly what Yeshua has done for us. Now, you don't establish truth by peddling fallacy. Don't fall into that trap. Don't seek to prove your point by creating things, creating doctrines out of thin air. It doesn't work. It doesn't bear good fruit. It only present, it prevents those who are truly coming into the faith and puts a stumbling block before them rather than putting a building block there for them. I want to take you back to Jeremiah. I want to reread the prophecy to you again. Lest you believe that it's a bad translation, pay close attention. Jeremiah 31, 31, Behold, the days are coming, says Yahweh, when I will make a berit chadasha with the house of Israel and with the house of Yehuda. Now listen, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers. Does this sound like a renewed covenant? Not according to the, com the, the covenant that I made with them at Mount Sinai. This sounds like a new covenant. Unless you believe this is a poor translation, let me show the Hebrew to you. This is lo chabarit. Lo is easy to remember in Hebrew because it rhymes with no. That's what it means. No, not. Not ha like the covenant, barit. Not like the covenant. This is exactly what it says in the Hebrew. So it is not a poor translation. So this begs the question, I understand what I said, Daniel said earlier that there were things that changed, but there was also things that stayed the same. Well, how do you reconcile that? What changed and what didn't? Well, that's why we're doing the study, so that you can look at it, because the Scripture bears witness of itself and explains to us the changes. It tells us what stayed the same. And as we continue in this prophecy in Jeremiah, we're going to discover our first change to the Old Covenant, from the Old Covenant to the new covenant. And not just that, we'll also discover the first similarity. Jeremiah 31, 33. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my Torah in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Now here we're given our first change from the old covenant to the new covenant. What was it? God tells us that under the new covenant, he would give his Torah a new address. In other words, where the Torah lied, the commandments of God, they were moved. They were given a new location. Under the old covenant, we find that the law had been written on stone tablets, those words that he spoke from Mount Sinai, as the people feared and trembled. Those were put into stone tablets. And where were they? They were in the Kodesh HaKodeshim in the Holy of Holies. This is where the new commandments, they rested, they, they, they lied. But, under the new covenant, what do we find? We find that the location of his law has been moved from those tablets that rested in the Kodesh HaKodeshim to the tablets of our heart. 
Now, does this mean that the law of God was done away with? Is that what the new covenant is? Is that the law was done away with? Of course not. The new covenant did just the opposite. We now, through faith in Yeshua, we have an intimate connection with God. That desire is now in us to actually observe the law of God. Why? Because it's been inscribed upon our hearts. So here we're given our first change, and here we're given our first similarity. The law stands. It didn't dissolve. It simply just received a new home. And coming to this realization might give you a slightly different perspective on the relevance of God's law for our lives today. Instead of running away from his law, what should we be doing? We should be embracing his law, his righteousness. Let me ask the question. How did the Lord move the commandments from stone tablets to the tablets of our heart? I want to take you back and show you how the primary terms of the covenant were originally written. Exodus 31, 18. We read, When God had made an end of speaking with Moshe on Mount Sinai, he gave Moses two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written with the finger of God. We're told here that it is the finger of God that literally etched into stone the Ten Commandments. Now, I want to give you a closer look into what this finger of God is that wrote the law. And I want to do this by taking you to two of the synoptic gospels, specifically Matthew and Luke. And what I'm going to do is this. I, I'm going to show you the same event or passage as recorded in both the book of Matthew and the book of Luke. And by so doing, we're going to learn something fascinating. Something fascinating about this finger of God. Because although Matthew and Luke record the very same event, we find that they do so in a slightly different manner. And what does this do for us? It opens up a world of understanding. Now, the specific passage we're going to look at here is where Yeshua, he's, just a, he's healed a blind man, a mute man, a man that was demon-possessed. He goes out, he casts out the demons. What do the Pharisees do? They come rushing in and say, huh, the only way you're doing this is by the ruler of demons, by, by Al Zavuv, by Al Zavuv. And so in response to this accusation of the Pharisees that he's casting out demons by the ruler of demons, Yeshua responds this way. We'll look at Luke's account first. Luke eleven twenty. But if I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Did you catch that? Yeshua just told us that he cast out demons by the finger of God. The very thing which we were told inscribed the law upon stone tablets. Now, I want you to look at the same passage as recorded by Matthew. It's going to give us a little bit more insight into what this finger of God is. Matthew records, But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. This is a powerful piece of information to possess. Understanding that the finger of God is in fact the Spirit of God gives us great insight into the mysterious work of the Lord. It gives us insight into his work into the new covenant where once the Spirit of God had etched into stone tablets his commandments, we now find that very same Spirit, that finger, etches into our hearts the commandments of God. The very same. And there's more to this. Let me put back up on, on the screen here for you the temple. What do we find sitting in the Holy of Holies? It's the centerpiece of it all. It's, just, it's, it's clearly the centerpiece of the world, but it is the centerpiece of the temple, okay? It's, it's, it's the focal point of everything. What is it? I will circle it. It is the Ark of the Covenant, all right? And what is hidden within the Ark? Well, we're told in Deuteronomy 10 that Moses put the commandments of God in the ark, the two stone tablets. Is that it? Is that all that resided in the Kodesh HaKodeshim? What else dwelt in the Holy of Holies? Well, let me take you back to Exodus 25, 8. Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. What else dwelt there? 
the Ruach HaKodesh. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the living God, dwelt in the holy place. Listen, listen to what the Lord says to Moses as he's instructing Moses concerning uh, the, the building of the ark. Exodus 25, 21. You shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony that I give you. Now, for those of you who have not really studied the ark, this box is the ark of the covenant. And hidden in this box were the stone tablets. This top portion here, right here, this top piece, all made of one piece, is the mercy seat. It's considered the throne of the living God. You read Psalm 80, the Lord dwells between the cherubim. All right? Now listen to what, what um, is said here as we go on to our next verse, verse 22. And there I will meet with you. Where? From between the cherubim, I will speak to you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are in the ark of the testimony about everything which I will give you in commandment to the children of Israel. So in the Holy of Holies, we just don't find that the commandments which were written by the finger of God, inscribed in stone, we don't just find those stone tablets there, but we also find that the Lord, the Spirit of the living God, was there. The presence of God was in the Holy of Holies. And with this information, I want to take you to Ezekiel 36 and show you how this all ties together, how the pieces of the puzzle start to come together. The following is clearly a prophecy on the new covenant. Exodus 36, 25. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Verse 27, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. You will keep my judgments and do them. This is the promise of the new covenant. Where once we found that the commandments which were written on stone uh, tablets and hidden away in the Holy of Holies, along with the dwelling presence of God, meaning the spirit of God, we now find that under the new covenant, his commandments, his spirit, now resides in us. And this is why we find Paul on many occasions referring to our bodies as the temple of God. Listen to what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 15. What accord has Mashiach with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them. Sound familiar? That was the very reason they constructed the tabernacle, that he might dwell among them. And in the Hebrew, it's tavech. It means it could dwell within them. I will dwell in them and walk among them. Now listen to what is said next. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. You need to understand something about this statement here. When you see this statement, I will be their God, and they shall be my people, this is a statement that explicitly refers to the new covenant. Every time you see this statement, you should be thinking new covenant. These are the very words that we read in the prophecy found in Jeremiah, Yirmiyahu, as he's testifying, as he prophesies, of the new covenant. They're the very same words spoken in Ezekiel. Ezekiel 37. Furthermore, we find similar passages that Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter use from Hosea chapter 2, where they were not once a people, but now they are the people of God. I will be their people. And the people will say, you are my God. This is about the new covenant. I want to take you back to the prophet Jeremiah. He's going to reveal another benefit of this new covenant. In verse 34, No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. This is the beauty of the new covenant. The first thing to note here is that he would remember our sin no more. What a blessing that is. As far as the east is to the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. He will never remember our sins no more. And clearly this is referring to what his son did for us 
at the cross, paying our penalty. Amen? And because of this, we find that because of this beautiful work that is, that is stated here, an intimacy is created. There's a beautiful intimacy here. He says, no longer. Look at what he says here in, in this passage as, I, as, I, as I'm perusing over it again. Look at what he says. He says, no longer will men say to each other, know the Lord, for they shall all know me. This is an intimate relationship that we have under the new covenant where literally the Spirit of God, it does what? It teaches us the things of God. It guides us in truth. It gives us understanding. Now, as far as this statement goes, all shall know me. What does that mean? I mean, I want you to think about something for a second. What does it truly mean to know the Lord? Do we have a scriptural reference that defines what it means to know the Lord? As luck would have it, we do. It has nothing to do with luck, but we do. 1 John 2, 3. Now by this we know that we know Him, if we keep His commandments. That's an amazing statement that ties in to the prophecy given in Jeremiah. Now by this we know that we know Him. If we are keeping his commandments, this is a self-test. So, if we put all of this together, we realize that being a part of the new covenant means that he would write his laws in our hearts and in our minds, signifying that we would, in fact, be doing what? Keeping his commandments. And because of that, we know him. This is how we know him. This is the fruit of those who are truly children of the new covenant. It's the proof that they have been sealed with the Holy Spirit because they're bearing the fruit of the Holy Spirit. So with that said, let's look at what we have covered thus far regarding the differences or the changes that exist between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Thus far, we have found that, number one, the law of God has received a new address. Okay, Move from stone tablets to the tablets of the heart. And yet, looking at this, we also find a similarity. Something that continued from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. And what is that? God's law. God's law stands. It didn't go anywhere. It didn't dissolve. It just received a new home. I want you to think about something for a minute. Pay close attention here. According to Yeshua in Matthew 15, the things that proceed from our mouth, we're told, come from our heart. Right? Okay. So if the New Covenant is in fact God writing his law on our heart, and the things that proceed from our mouth come from the heart, what will proceed from our mouth? The law. Right? Torah will come out of our heart. Fascinating, when you look at the ministry of Yeshua, he gets baptized, he gets anointed with the Ruach HaKodesh. Interesting, what are the first words recorded out of his mouth as he comes out of the wilderness? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent. What was he saying out of his mouth? Torah. Righteousness was pouring forth. Living waters were coming forth. If you're truly a child of the new covenant, and you understand the covenant, you could never say out of your mouth, the law is done away with. That's an impossibility. That's a complete contradiction. To be a child of the new covenant, to stand in faith in Yeshua, Torah will proceed from my mouth. Let's look at the second thing. The Spirit of God now dwells in us. That's beautiful. The Spirit of God, where it dwelt once a time in the Holy of Holies, the Holy Spirit, this is God. We're now told that He dwells within us, and thus, we are now called the temple of God. Very powerful. With that said, let's move on to our next change that occurred upon moving from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. And what is that change? It's the Aaronic priesthood. The Aaronic priesthood is changed. Now the writer of Hebrews, he describes this whole process in great detail and how this change had come about. And what we are going to see here right off the bat is that the writer of Hebrews, he does something very, very intelligent. We find that he strategically builds a case 
before he dare make some ridiculously controversial statements. Statements, mind you, that have the ability to cause quite a stir. Like those words that we read from Paul in Galatians 4, when he actually started saying stuff like, uh, that beautiful covenant that was given on Mount Sinai, yeah, that gives birth to bondage. And oh yeah, the holy city, the city of the great king, Yerushalayim, yeah, she's in bondage too. Those will get you, words like that will get you stoned. And you're going to see similar statements uh, being made here. So let's take a look at this commentary by the writer of Hebrews uh, on this change to the priesthood. In Hebrews 7, 1, we read, For this Melchizedek, king of Shalem, or you could say Shalom, priest, Cohen, of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness, and then also king of Shalem, meaning king of peace. Now the writer of Hebrews, he tells us that this Malkisedic, the name Malkisedic, actually means king of righteousness. And he's right. If you look at the construction of his name in the Hebrew, we discover that the first part, Malach, Malach in Hebrew, is king. Amem Lamed Chaf Sophie. It's Malach is king. And then you have Zedek, Malkisedek. His name literally means, it's construction in Hebrew, king of righteousness. Now, we're told that this uh, Malkisedek was not just a king. He wasn't just the king of Shalem or Shalom. He wasn't just the king of righteousness. We're told he is also a Kohen. Very, very important. At the same time, this wasn't at different intervals in his life. He bore both of these titles at once. Why is this significant? It's significant because we find Yeshua himself holds both these titles at once. This is one of the fascinating characteristics of Yeshua. He is not just a Malach. He's not just a king. He is also a Kohen. And the Jewish prophets foretold of the Mashiach that this is what he would be. The Mashiach to come in Zechariah 6.12. Thus says the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the Zemach, or the branch. From his place he shall branch out. He shall build the temple of the Lord. Yes, he shall build the temple of the Lord. He shall bear the glory and sit and rule on his throne. This is a messianic prophecy about the Mashiach that was to come. He was to build the temple and he's going to rule on the throne. He is the Mashiach ben David. He's the son of David. He is the heir to the throne. He is a king. This is talking about a king. But as we continue, that's not all. Then we read, So he shall be a Kohen on his throne, and the council of peace shall be between both offices. Now the offices of, of which the prophet is referring to here is none other than the office of king and also the office of priesthood. Where we're told that there's going to be a council of peace between these two offices. And what that means is that the same guy would hold both offices simultaneously at once. Now, that's not all. The writer of Hebrews goes on to describe, to give more attributes about this Malkisedek because he's building a case. He says in verse 3, This Malkisedek was without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life but made like the Son of God, remains a Cohen continually. The writer of Hebrews, he's sharing all these attributes that Melchizedek possessed because he's purposely, he's drawing parallels here that exist between Melchizedek and Yeshua. Because just as Melchizedek had neither beginning of days nor end of days, so too we find Yeshua, he had neither beginning of days nor end of days. Do I have any scripture to back that up? I do. Micah 5.2 but you of Bethlehem Ephrata, though you are little among the thousands of Yehuda, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth are from old, from everlasting, Mime Olam. In other words, his going forth are from eternity. He has neither beginning of days nor end of days. Yeshua, like Malchizedek, are identical. All these parallels that Malchizedek present, uh, uh, had possessed, they were all symbolic of the greater one that was to come, the son of the living God. Now the writer of Hebrew goes on to state in verse 4 in chapter 7, 
Now consider how great this man was, speaking of Melchizedek, to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. Abraham tithed to Melchizedek. You can read Genesis 14. And indeed, those who are the sons of Levi, who receive the priesthood, have a commandment to receive tithes from the people, according to the Torah. And you read Torah, you find that's true. That is from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Avraham. In other words, the writer is seeing, hey, that the Kohanim, the Levites, they were separated. As they were coming out of Egypt, the Lord separated the Levites to serve him. And they received the tithes. Not just the sons of Aaron, but, but all of the Levites received tithes from the children of Israel. Now we go on to verse 6. But he whose genealogy is not derived from them receives tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. Now beyond all contradiction... The lesser is blessed by the better. In other words, the lesser, Avraham, is blessed by the better, Melchizedek. Here, mortal men receive tithes, but there he receives them, of whom it is witness that he lives. Even Levi, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Now, the writer here, he's going to go on to get to the heart of the matter where we're about to witness... The change from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. Verse 11. Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the Torah, what further need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek and not according to the order of Aaron? You need to remember that when the children of Israel entered into covenant with God at Mount Sinai, one of the core elements instituted at this time was the fact that the Lord had commissioned Aaron and his sons to serve as Kohanim, right? And in addition to that, the tribe of Levi, their brethren, they were given to the, to the sons of Aaron by God to perform the work of the tabernacle or the temple. And as you already know, this priesthood played a very, very significant role in God's covenant with Israel because it was the priest who made atonement for the children of Israel. They're the ones that performed the temple services. They're the ones that taught the people the law. They were the ones who gave the people the understanding. The priests were the ones who declared lepers clean, and they were the ones who declared them unclean. It was the Kohanim. But the writer of Hebrews here In verse 11, he alludes to the fact that perfection didn't come through the Kohanim, the priesthood that was given at Mount Sinai. He notes here that if perfection had, in fact, come through the Levitical priesthood, then there would absolutely have been no, it would have been unnecessary for another priest to come because that would have been it. That was done. That was the the finality of it all. There's no need for a priest to rise according to the order of Melchizedek. Now listen to what the writer says next in regard to this Aaronic priesthood, which would certainly get you stoned in the first century. The priesthood being changed of necessity, there's also a change of the law. What a statement. Highly controversial. This is one of those statements that absolutely could get you stoned. There's a significant change, the writer tells us, moving from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. And it further reveals that this new covenant isn't merely a renewed covenant. It is new. It is built upon better promises with a different priesthood. This is quite significant. I want you to think of it this way. I'll draw an analogy for you to understand the difference between renewed and new covenant. My computer, and I know this has never happened to you. It only happens to me. I'm using it, all of a sudden it freezes up. So frustrating, you're right in the middle of the work, and provided your hard drive didn't crash, it freezes up. What do you do? When your system fails, when the system fails, what do you do? You reboot. Isn't that what we do? We reboot. When we reboot, what happens? I have the same hard drive, I have the same operating system, and I have the same software. If I was to reboot, that is a great example of renewed covenant. It was made new again. It was refreshed, and now it's functioning, right? That is a good ideology, that's a good metaphor to to paint you a picture of what it would mean to be renewed. Now let me show you what a new covenant would look like. The same thing happened to me on my computer, okay? It was, it was, it, it froze on me. I reboot, but this time, though I have the same hardware, when I reboot, to my surprise, it is an XP operating system. I'm given Windows 7. 
It's a different operating system. This is a good analogy for you to have when considering what, what really would be the difference between renewed, the ideology of renewed versus new covenant. We're under a new operating system. This is not the same. Don't let anyone tell you. We may still have the same hard drive. Yes, the law of God stands. But you have to know, you have to understand, and you have to appreciate the difference going from the old to the new. Because then only then do you truly understand what Yeshua did for you. Shabbat Shalom. Music team can come back up. Um, next week we are going to be uh, continuing on talking about the new covenant. We're going to get into the deeper matters of Torah, uh, the much deeper matters of Torah, and how we walk it out, not according to the letter, but according to the Spirit. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom.